Ready? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to concurrent session number three, strategies to promote colorectal cancer screening in underrepresented communities. I am Joseph Ravenel, uh, and uh, I'm privileged to moderate this uh, uh, session. We have uh, an incredible slate of uh, speakers for you, uh, whom I will introduce in just a, a minute. Uh, but I just want to introduce this session by saying that it dovetails perfectly with the session uh, that just ended uh, related to structural racism and its impact on health outcomes generally, but specifically on colorectal cancer. And what was talked about by the incredible speakers there was the need for structural and policy level change in order for us to mitigate and eliminate the violence uh, that communities of color see with regard to uh, health inequities. And uh, so what we're gonna talk about today is what has to happen in concert with those policy changes. Policy changes will result in uh, expanded access for the communities that we are uh, talking about uh, and more uh, anti-racist policies will create the access that will then uh, allow many of these communities to be connected to uh, the life-saving screening uh, that we uh, care so much about in the round table. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about strategies mm -hmm. to connect to those communities mm -hmm. and, to, uh, and to ensure that those communities are connected uh, to the, the screening services that we're able to uh, uh, provide. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our speakers. Uh, first, Dr. Uh, Janice Krieger, who is a professor in the Department of, of Advertising and the director of the STEM Translational Communication Center at the University of Florida. Tracy Russell, um, she is a population health nurse uh, at Healthcare for the Homeless. Dr. Charles Rogers, uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine, and Dr. Roshanda Chenier, uh, who is the project manager and outreach officer uh, and community engagement leader at the Dan L. Duncan Comprehensive Cancer Center at Baylor College of Medicine. Thank you for joining us for this session and uh, Dr. Krieger, take it away. Great, thank you so much for having me. It is such a delight to be part of, of such a wonderful panel and I'm really looking forward to the discussion and looking forward to feedback. Next. Uh, just, I know we are all aware of the importance of colorectal cancer screening. I just wanted to put this up, this slide up quickly because when we look at data about racial ethnic differences in cancer, um, incidents of mortality. What was really striking to us as we started this project was um, the higher level of incidence of mortality, especially by black males. When we uh, started this project, the goal was to address uh, some uh, at the University of Florida, we're in North Florida, um, in a very rural catchment area. And there are a lot of structural barriers for our, our rural patients and some of our uh, nearby urban patients when it comes to um, structural barriers in terms of getting into the clinic to even get a recommendation for colorectal cancer screening. And so what we developed was a telemedicine approach uh, to patient education about colorectal cancer screening and accompanied that with a male fit intervention so that 
uh, we could reduce, uh, facilitate getting a recommendation for screening, and then actually allow patients to complete that screening at home without ever having to have a copay for a visit. Uh, little did we know we were preparing for COVID um, by creating a completely contactless uh, intervention for promoting screening. Um, and so we have uh, been very fortunate that we've been able to carry on this intervention uh, throughout the pandemic and look at ways to um, maintain screening. There is a, a recent article, uh, a commentary that was published in Cancer uh, last week that looked at uh, used Michigan data to compare the different types of screening. And as we know, uh, breast screening, colorectal cancer screening, uh, all you know decreased during uh, COVID, but all, home stool testing did also. Um, and so we don't have data on that in our catchment area, but we know that the pandemic, even when there are these opportunities to do home screening, which we really need to look into, uh, even as this pandemic continues, um, it's an ongoing need to figure out how to meet the needs of patients. Next. Our telehealth intervention is based on a precision messaging approach. Uh, some of you might know this by the term of tailoring. And essentially we know that when, when we tailor messages to patients, they perceive the information as being more relevant. Uh, they're more willing to act on them. And so what we're trying to do is use information that we know uh, about patients in the EHR and connect that with the messages that they receive about the need to screen. Um, we're doing this, uh, two, two things I'd like to highlight. One is um, we're using it, uh, for example, if we know patients have a Spanish language preference, we can offer them a Spanish language uh, version of the intervention. Um, we also are incorporating, looking at what components of different behavioral theories are most important for which patients. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're finding in that area. Okay. The intervention is delivered using uh, virtual human technology. And so virtual humans uh, have a, um, their computer generated images uh, ours are enhanced by an artist. Um, we found that the you, you can create virtual humans just using computer programs. Uh, when we tested them with patients, they did not like them. They were not human-like enough. Um, and so we hired an artist that creates uh, video games to help us enhance the appearance of our virtual humans. Uh, we started, we have uh, six demographic groups uh, in our intervention. Uh, males and females uh, representing Black African Americans, uh, Hispanic Latinos, uh, and our white population, and rural and urban for both. Uh, so we did, uh, we had six different demographic groups. We did extensive focus group um, and user testing. They helped us develop the virtual humans. They helped develop uh, all the different components um, uh, that we're using. And I'll talk a little bit about the findings next. Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot about the animation there. Um, the one other thing I'd like to kind of note is uh, in the tailoring, the virtual human asks the participant particular questions. For example, you know, what are your key barriers and is able to provide tailored responses. So if a participant is really concerned about the cost, uh, we can talk about what the cost of colorectal cancer screening is. If they're worried about embarrassment, um, we have messages that uh, are uh, that reduce barriers. Um, and it also demonstrates correct stool collection. Um, if you have never done a stool test or looked at the instructions, you know, one of the barriers that in our health system was that many people were doing uh, stool testing incorrectly. Um, so we got a group together and it was, you know, eight to 10 PhDs and PhD students, and we could not figure out how to follow the instructions. Um, so we went through an extensive period with our oncologists and our family medicine uh, practitioners to create a visual illustration using the virtual human of how you correctly complete a home stool test. 
So just to summarize, uh, the intervention is designed to be patient-centered and focus on home stool testing. We're emphasizing tailored messaging so that we can address um, the information that's most important to our different uh, to our participants and our patients. Uh, and it's delivered by a virtual health assistant. Um, one of the features, you know, in addition to language, is the demographic matching that we're able to do. Um, and partly that was based on focus group feedback as we were developing the virtual humans, uh, particularly our minority communities. Uh, you know, we know that there aren't an, um, as many minority healthcare providers as we'd really like to see uh, in the workforce. And while we work on increasing that number, which is really important, um, they were really interested and excited about having a virtual health assistant that represented their uh, ethnic and minority identity. Next. We focused on agile software development process, which is collaborative, collaborative iterative, uh, so that we can fail fast. And what that means is we would uh, work with, we had a community advisory board, you see a picture, a picture there, and those are patients, those are advocates, those are people in the community uh, that um, represent our patient population, some of them represent colorectal cancer screening, some represent uh, cancer screening more generally, to, to really give honest feedback about what we're doing and when we're taking a wrong turn to, to, to help turn us around. Um, and in fact, we've had a, a, a member of our community advisory board who, who didn't want to get screened, and that's why we invited them to be part of our board, um, is to really share with us why she wouldn't screen. Um, and she ended up screening as part of her uh, involvement with our CAB and was diagnosed with uh, late stage cancer, but was able to get uh, colorectal cancer, was able to get treated, and she's now a survivor. And um, we find this to be a, a great testament to the importance of uh, community-based uh, approaches to developing interventions. Next. Uh, the intervention is currently being implemented uh, in eight clinics, two urban clinics uh, and six rural clinics in North Central Florida. Uh, we're finding that uh, particularly our minority patients do better when uh, they are paired with a racially concordant virtual human. Interestingly, I mentioned that we were testing the different, uh, different behavioral theories and, and how they were associated with outcomes. Uh, one really important thing is self-efficacy, which was uh, we operationalize the demonstration of how to do a fit. Uh, we have 10 different predictors in the intervention uh, showing a patient the video of how to do a fit uh, is by far the strongest predictor of whether they're interested in, in requesting a fit. So the importance of making it, demonstrating how easy it is, exactly how to do it, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough. Um, we're implementing multiple recruitment methods to improve our workflow integration. Uh, this intervention was designed to be delivered uh, via MyChart, sort of with that within that telehealth model. And for some of our patient populations, that is a barrier. So we've been working really hard with our computer science team to develop uh, methods that take it out of my chart um, that, so that they can access the intervention without that. And we're really excited because we hope the next phase will be more of an implementation phase in additional clinics that we can find uh, collaborators to move this beyond the UF health system. Uh, and this type of workflow will really facilitate that work. Uh, and then uh, finally, we've been working on uh, developing a Sp the Spanish-speaking virtual human. Um, there were some really interesting uh, components uh, preparing that for that population. As many of us know, uh, especially in Florida, um, you know, we talk about Hispanic Latino, but in, in our project, we, we tend to talk about Spanish language preference uh, because there are so many different uh, cultural identities that, that fall within um, Hispanic or Latino. And it was very difficult to, to create a character to finalize the, the linguistic elements uh, because the different groups, you know, don't, didn't agree. Um, but we finally come up with something that everyone felt was, was appropriate. Um, and that is just about to be launched in our Jacksonville clinics. Okay. 
I have a 10 second clip to show you of one of our virtual humans. Okay, you can start it. Thank you for that information. Based on your responses, eating red meat, drinking alcohol, and smoking, even if it's just occasionally, can increase your chances of getting colon cancer. So that was an example of, uh, we asked participants to, about their, diff the virtual human asked the participant about their different risk factors. Uh, and that was an example of, of giving feedback based on those, ri those risk factors. Okay, uh, so that's a brief overview of our project. And I just want to thank you again for, for inviting me. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Eric Cooks, who's on the presentation. Uh, he is our project director and has been invaluable in this experience. And we will both be on to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much. That so was. Much. Uh, oh. Sorry about that. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, great. I think we're in business. Um, hi and good afternoon. Um, that was just really interesting and I love the creative approach uh, through which um, different clinics are uh, accessing uh, care for clients and providing care for clients. Um, so that was just really, really fascinating. Um, thank you to the NCCRT for the opportunity to be here today um, and present. Um, I can't promise that my segment will be as entertaining as uh, Dr. Wender breaking out into song yesterday, but I will do my best. Um, so here, uh, my name is Tracy again, and I'm here uh, to share some of our work in addressing colorectal cancer screenings here at Healthcare for the Homeless Baltimore. Um, so we strive to care for dignity for um, about 9,300 uh, people per year. Um, we have three main sites with our uh, main clinic pictured here, um, and we have two other sites, a mobile van and a respite care center. Um, our services are multidisciplinary and include medical, behavioral health, psych, dental, case management, community health work, and housing services. We are an NCQA PCMH recognized federally qualified health center. Um, in addition to providing quality health care, we also strive to provide affordable housing and livable incomes for all. And recognizing that our patient experiences significant health disparities, we set out to make one of our 2020 strategic goals as follows. As a result of our care, the health outcomes of our clients will rival the health outcomes of the stably housed population. Next slide, please. Speaking of health disparities, cancer is no exception, uh, with cancer-related deaths actually affecting double the rate of individuals experiencing homelessness than the average adult population. This speaks not only to the de degree of disparity that often exists in the homeless population, but also the need to prioritize cancer screenings in order to reduce cancer-related deaths in this population. As you can imagine, there are a number of barriers that keep our clients from being screened for cancer, with the evidence identifying some of the main culprits as the lack of insurance, competing priorities, a lack of knowledge about the importance or process, and anticipated discomfort or misperceptions amongst other barriers. We all know that cancer, screening can, cancer screenings can detect, prevent, and treat cancer when caught early. So preventive cancer screenings are a vital part of whole person care. And yet a few years ago, we identified that as an agency, we weren't doing so well um, with cancer screenings, not only compared with the stably housed population, but also compared with more similar co cohorts at other FQHCs. And so we began our work in really promoting cancer screenings a few years back. Next slide. Um, this is just some of our demographic data from this year um, where I've highlighted some of our uh, largest subsets of clients. You can see to the left that uh, over half of our clients are Black or African American, about a quarter identify as Hispanic or Latino, and only 15% identify as white. Um, looking to the far right, um, it comes as no surprise based on the race data that the preferred language for about a quarter of our clients is Spanish. So as you can see, we serve a very diverse population of clients. And while we haven't tailored our work 
um, specifically to uh, a specific race or ethnicity, we've always strived as an agency to reduce health disparities for our clients as a whole, with the larger makeup of our clients being Black or Hispanic. Next slide. So here you'll see an overview of some of our primary initiatives over recent years. We tried to take a multifaceted approach uh, to make our outcomes more effective and sustainable. So we started out with setting the culture of the agency, looking for buy-in first from our leadership so that our efforts would be supported. And we also made CRC screenings one of our PI goals in 2016 to really promote visibility and accountability to this work. We also worked on developing the tools and trainings needed by our frontline workers on the medical team. We created a form in our EMR called the Preventive Health Tracker, which I'll display in a few slides. And we worked to standardize our workflows to ensure that cancer screenings were addressed at every medical visit. As part of this work, we created standing orders so CMAs and RNs could order cancer screenings independently. And we created mandatory competencies to ensure staff were well equipped to follow the workflows. We also found that when staff prioritized preventive health measures and front-ended this work in their visits, our metrics improved. We tried to make cancer screenings as accessible to our clients as possible. Uh, we incorporated cancer screening education into standing groups on a rotating basis. We put on incentivized events like an annual Women's Health Day to educate women on preventive health care and enabled them the opportunity to sign up for same-day PAPs, rapid hep C, HIV testing, obtain their fit. Um, we always give clients the choice to choose between the fit and the colonoscopy and leave it up to them to decide what's best for them. Um, and we created a registry of clients who are past due for their CRC screenings, which our CMAs used to call clients to catch them up on their care. We couldn't engage in this work without addressing social determinants of health. And due to the many competing priorities of our clients, we made Subway gift cards available in the beginning to incentivize CRC screenings. We also gave clients uh, with transportation barriers the option to mail in their fits instead of having to bring them back to the clinic. And we used some of our grant funding to create colonoscopy prep bags filled with supplies clients could use during bowel prep, such as clear liquid options, a roll of double ply toilet paper and reusable water bottles. Since there are so many barriers for our clients, we also recognize the need to provide patient navigation support, as well as the support of our community health workers to help with things like reminder calls and transportation to appointments. And finally, since we wanted to provide the most patient-centered care possible, we found it vital to include the voice of our clients at the table. And we relied really heavily on their feedback to guide many of our interventions. Next slide. This is a control chart of our CRC rates from the time we began our work in 2016 through the end of last year. As you can see, we started out with really low rates in the 30s, and, uh, but those rates steadily climbed with the start of our interventions by almost 20% over the first year. Uh, we reached the, the low 50s in the second year and finally the mid 50s in the third year after implementing the patient navigation program and introducing competency testing. Um, and while we were still very far from hitting that 80% that so many of you have, um, have hit, by the third year of our initiative, we had surpassed screening rates of other community health clinics by 10%. Next. This is a second control chart of our rates from 2019 to 2020. And as you can see, there is a gradual decline in our rates, um, which unsurprisingly was exacerbated post COVID. Uh, we've been hovering in the upper 40s since that time. And we recognize that we have some work to do in order to catch up a large subset of our eligible clients on their cancer screenings. Um, we did try to have a fit mailing campaign in July, which mildly bumped up our rates, but didn't produce significant results. Next. So this is the example of that preventive health tracker form that I mentioned before. Um, and this, is, uh, this was created in an effort to consolidate many of our preventive health measures onto one form. Our medical providers voiced that it was really time consuming trying to look through many different parts of the EMR and the chart to find this information. And so we thought this would make life a little easier for them. Uh, you can see in the top section are, um, is info on several cancer screening measures and the status of those screenings. So they'll turn red when a client is due and green when a client is up to date or when a 
a particular screening is not required. Uh, we also included some additional features on this form, including when vaccines were last administered, labs were last completed, and referrals or tests were ordered. And since implementing this form, we've received so much positive feedback uh, from our medical team. Um, this gets used regularly in real time during client visits. And this has really um, been instrumental in sustaining our preventive cancer screening rates along with our other preventive um, health measures. Next. Um, at the start of our efforts, we made a big push to inform and educate our clients around CRC screenings through some homegrown flyers. Uh, we looked at public campaign materials, but felt that they didn't reflect our client population well. So here we included uh, photos of our medical providers who are very familiar to our clients and included some simple facts and um, myth busting facts about cancer and publicized our subway gift card incentives to really try to educate and promote cancer, colorectal cancer screenings. Next. Um, I just wanted to highlight um, one of our efforts regarding our community health workers and our a GI clinic partnership that we have um, with a GI clinic just up the street at Mercy Hospital, where one of um, the GI, the gastroenterologist is willing to see even our uninsurable clients and has reserved a session bi-weekly to seeing some of our most vulnerable clients. So originally only 30 to 40% of our clients showed up for these appointments due to various barriers. And this left a lot of potential visits on the table. So when we identified this as a problem, our CHW team stepped in to make the most of this partnership, um, getting to the list of uh, clients in advance uh, where they would call the clients on their respective care team and provide a reminder call uh, and offer escort services. And since implementing this change idea, the show rates have improved to 50 to 75% on a regular basis. Um, in the photos here are some of our uh, CHWs on our CHW team. Next. Um, I also wanted to highlight one of our initiatives uh, that took some time to develop involving navigation support for clients in order to complete their colonoscopies. Um, our rates for colonoscopy completion were very poor. Um, and so, um, so we are, uh, when an external cancer program approached us to offer to partner with our organization to provide this support for us, we, ab we absolutely jumped on the opportunity, um, thinking that this would be a great solution. And at the time, we didn't feel that we had the right resources and roles internally to provide this level of support. So we did a pilot uh, over the course of six months, a fairly long pilot, where only one of 17 clients that we referred to this program actually completed their colonoscopy, which was very problematic. And so we dissolved the pilot and thought for the first time about the possibility of engaging our internal staff in providing navigation support. So we designated our nurses as the primary navigators since they already meet one-on-one -on -one with clients and have experience with client care coordination. What we do is our nurses meet with clients before the GI consult, as well as before the procedure. And at each juncture, they identify any barriers and then connect clients with the resources needed to overcome those barriers. And this has been very successful um, in our colonoscopy completion rates. Next. These are some of our lessons learned. Um, I won't go through all of them. I'll just highlight that um, we wanted to make the work as easy as possible for our staff to do to make this work sustainable. Uh, we thought it was really important to see through the lens of our clients um, whose feedback we relied very, very heavily on. Uh, we had to work to create this culture of, of preventive, prioritizing preventive health care since this isn't always at the top um, and radar of our medical team. Um, and we found that providing mandatory competencies on a regular basis were, was really important because one-time trainings weren't sufficient. Um, next. And in closing, um, just in, in terms of our future work, we realize we have with COVID, we have some our work cut out for us. We plan to have some additional fit mailing campaigns, particularly as many of our clients have moved to telehealth visits. Um, in recognition that racial inequity is uh, a huge problem, uh, the HCH Baltimore has re recently formed an internal committee to discuss and promote racial equity. 
And our plan for 2021 is actually to look at our metrics, um, look at our subpopulations by metrics, um, by race and ethnicity in an effort to identify any disparities that might exist uh, so that we can address them. And we actually plan to start this work with our uncontrolled diabetes clients where we see a huge disparity, particularly amongst our Hispanic Latin, Latinx population with having a much higher rate of uncontrolled diabetes. And we hope to then translate that work into other metrics as well. Um, thank you so much again for allowing us to share our work and to spend some time with you this afternoon. Here. Awesome. So good afternoon. Um, I bring you greetings from the uh, University of Utah School of Medicine, as well as Huntsman Cancer Institute, um, as well as the University of Michigan Mixed Methods Program. Um, shout out to all who have put this great um, event to get together, as well as the invitation. I'll be speaking briefly on how eradicating CRC inequities among African American men is a game of chess, um, not checkers. So these studies in my talk today are, are supported extensively. Um, so I definitely want to express uh, quite a bit of gratitude to participants, partners, and funders who made these studies possible. Um, yet I would like to note that this content is solely my responsibility and does not necessarily represent the official views of the NIH, University of Utah, Huntsman Cancer Institute, Michigan Miss Methods, or any other entity pictured here. So growing up in the African American community, I never heard about colorectal cancer. I only heard about breast cancer for black women and um, prostate cancer for black men. Um, well, my family is really big on family reunions, doing numerous things that increase your risk for colorectal cancer, um, such as you know drinking alcohol, um, smoking, um, eating processed foods such as hot dogs, etc. But also doing some things that decrease your risk, such as uh, you know being physically active, doing dances such as a cha-cha slide, an electric slide. Well, we had noticed that my aunt here had lost quite a bit of weight, so we just figured that potentially she was um, you know eating better, um, but. Unfortunately, a few months later, she got misdiagnosed numerous times before she was diagnosed as state with stage four CRC. So this happened to her at age 52. She was able to thrive through this preventable disease for um, eight years, but we can just imagine that she may have been still here today if she had got screened at age uh, 50, which is, we all know is a debate now versus 45. Uh, but nonetheless, I like to start all of my talks with uh, a shout out to her for allow me to find my purpose but also as a reminder to each of you that you all have personally been direct you know been affected by crc as well and hopefully you use that as a driver for the important work that you're doing so um if we focus on why i've been focusing on um black men for crc um if we look at me look at the statistics for me as a black male i have a 24 percent higher chance of getting colon cancer than a white male and a 47 percent higher chance of dying from it since um, pictures are better for some people to learn, if we look at these stats here um, provided by Siegel and colleagues earlier this year, if we look at uh, the chances of getting CRC and mortality for CRC, we can look at, look at for black men, they have the highest chances of getting it among other racial ethnic groups, as well as the highest chances of dying it, but we'll see similar disparities for their black female counterparts as well, with black women having the higher chances of getting it um, and dying from it. But again, I've been focusing on black men also because they have the highest chances of getting CRC and dying from it compared to everyone, males and females. So in some of my previous work, where I try to see some of the factors that are contributing to um, this disparity, I looked at the relationship between social support, um, racism, um, and masculinity. So, um, um, you know, the racism piece came about, uh, you know, during this time because a lot of uh, black men were getting killed by cops. 
um, you know, the start of the Black Lives Matter movement. So I felt that this had an indirect influence on how these guys may perceive access to care. Um, but specifically, when we looked at this systematic review of the literature, um, quite a bit of work was done in the area of social support. That was actually most of the studies um, over roughly a 15 year time span as far back as 2000. Um, and so we were able to conclude that additional research should be extended beyond providers to patient navigators who can facilitate improved CRC screening for African-American men and foster empowerment and, tr and trust. In regards to racism, only two studies have been done um, and we really focused on the needs to unpack the confluence of factors that place medically underserved African-American men with few socioeconomic resources at increased risk for delayed CRC screening and related dissimilar outcomes um, to definitely require further explanation. Similarly, in the space of masculinity, um, only two studies have been done as well with racism and masculinity, both of these studies being qualitative in nature. Uh, with the masculinity piece, we really stress the need for a conceptual framework that leveraged the strengths of masculinity and moderated concerns among black men to bring um, cancer screening decision completion specifically to the forefront. Um, I'd like to note too, that with my systematic reviews, I always uh, you know, create a methodological quality score. So of these studies, um, they were able to get a score of total of 19 points. Um, some highlights of these is that only one study exclusively focused on African American men. You can see that with the total 19 points, um, the ranges were from 5 to 15, where um, less than 42% of the studies were um, greater than the average. You can see even with these, with these, with these studies, they had an average quality of about 10. Um, but I would like to point out that of these studies, um, only 37% reported any validity. So, you know, with the work that's being done, how much of it actually really matters. So to build on this, to think about how can we really get to this masculinity, um, you know, barriers to care piece. Um, uh, I was funded in, in 18 for $900,000 study with the National Cancer Institute, um, which I coined as Cutting CRC. Um, and so Cutting CRC really focuses on using um, the barbershop as a way to um, address masculinity barriers to medical care for black men who are really not obtaining CRC screening. Um, so for those women I know, barbershops are trusted, community-based, culturally appropriate venues for information sharing within African-American communities. Um, due to COVID, um, we've even expanded this work to churches um, because I learned that some barbers in some states, because this is actually going on in Utah, Minnesota, and Ohio, um, they're not used to being community leaders. Um, so uh, making sure that you meet people where they are is key with this type of work. But uh, for this type, for the time, for the purposes of time, I will go into in, to share some of the findings from the eleven focus group that we have uh, conducted across the three states. So um, with this work that's currently impressed, I you know I approved the proofs today, so this should be out within the next two weeks. Um, when we asked these guys what kinds of things might cause one not to visit a doctor for care, you can see mistrust was huge. We saw costs, we saw pain. Um, one participant noted, when you're dealing with life and death, when you're in your 60s, you're not thinking about being a guinea pig, you want to be healed. Um, there was the issue of self-reliance put forth where self-reliance can be somewhat defined as resolving your own issues by self-treating or self-educating. Um, one participant noted, I think we've made convenient issues for ourselves for not going to get checked up. Similarly, uh, we asked what kinds of things might make an African-American male more likely to obtain a colonoscopy. Um, we can see here we have family history, the recommendation from providers, knowledge, insurance. Uh, we have one participant who noted, um, you, have a, you have to have a good doctor that just doesn't care about you, but that cares about people in general. What kinds of things I make less likely obtain? We see this mischarist of peace again, which was actually rampant in all responses. Um, we see fear, we see costs, we see racism. Um, with the mistrust piece, once participant noted, I don't trust the more white boys. I think about Tuskegee and all the other things. A lot of times, I really don't think that they, being white doctors, care whether I live or not. There was also the fear of weakness presented. Uh, we've been raised to be a strong masculine man and not care, let alone understand what is going on with our bodies. As I'm running out of time, unfortunately, I can't go in too much detail, but this is also some hotspot work that we did um, earlier this summer, um, where our team identified hotspot areas across the US, those being counties where CRC is on the rise and killing young men at high rates, while considering individual and county level CRC outcome determinants. 
Um, as you can see, we found that many of these new diagnoses are occurring in counties with the lower, in the lower Mississippi Delta, West Central Appalachia area, as well as Eastern Virginia, North Carolina. Um, of note, Chadwick Bozeman hometown of Anderson County, South Carolina is a hotspot that we found. Um, also of note, we observed that roughly 14% of all the adults are current, even though 14% of all US adults are current smokers, 24% of the adult population residing in hotspot counties reported currently smoking and having smoked at least 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. So as I conclude, um, I think it's very important for us to remember that CRC is preventable, treatable, and beatable disease that no one has to die from. As a, you know, as a task force screen at age 45 recommendation is finally being strongly considered, it's up to each of us to continue advocating how lowering the screening at age for all African-American men included will literally save thousands of lives and dollars. Um, Brother Chadwick Boson being diagnosed with stage three CRC at age 39 is unacceptable. Um, I have been fighting for Chadwick's legacy and the lives of many other members of the medically underserved and minority populations for 10 years. May each of you not grow weary in your fight, which is a game of chess, not checkers. Thanks for your time. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Rashawn Shanir, and I'm gonna tell you all about our education entertainment and related to colorectal cancer. Um, disparities in utilization of the cancer uh, screen tests continue to contribute to the increased burden in our medically underserved minority community populations. And as you can see, this is something, um, this is a map of Harris County and the surrounding counties, uh, which are eight surrounding counties of our MSA um, that we target and group education and edu education-based interventions are recommended to promote screening test utilization. So we use innovative strategies to disseminate education mes messages about culturally sensitive matters. Next slide. So with that being said, we use our theater outreach program. We work with local playwrights to develop culturally and linguistically appropriate uh, full length plays and monologues. Our office of outreach collaborate with com community organizations that will serve as hosts and uh, they will host the plays and the monologues for underserved populations in areas where there are high incidence of cancer. We sponsor one play and uh, two colorectal cancer monologues, both in English and Spanish to raise awareness about colorectal cancer education and prevention. Next slide. So, uh, for the sake of this presentation, we're going to focus on the third row, which is, um, we have La Vida es un sueño, that's in Spanish, that's our, our Spanish-speaking monologue targeted towards the Lat Latino, Latina, Latinx uh, population. We have the bottom line, which is targeted towards the African-American community, and the marriage test, which is a full-length play, and Uncle Vu has the answer, is in Vietnamese, and that currently airs on Viet TV, um, which is uh, just aired through the television. Next slide. So the components that we have for the live performances, it is not something that we just throw out there. We, we have thought this out thoroughly where we have promotional flyers that we share online, that we share through email and that we have printed to share with our partners. And the performances are not long for the monologues. They're about 10 to 15 minutes in length in order to keep the audience captivated. And it is site specific, as I mentioned to you before. And these are done performed by professional actors. We develop a playbill that has cancer prevention information and resources so that when the attendees leave, they can have resources available to do follow up um, on their own to take action rather. And we do collect data. We have a pre and post performance survey that we give out. And at the end of the performance, we do have a Q&A session where the health educator is provi provided there to take questions from the audience along with um, letting them know, giving them that comfort space of knowing that it's okay for them to ask any question, no question too big or too small. And we also have educational materials and, along with the access navigator uh, from our community, our main community partners to uh, access health services throughout the community. Next slide. 
So these are just some examples of our educational materials, um, our marketing materials that we have. At the very top are promotional flyers. They are disseminated again by print, through email, through um, online resources, and uh, oftentimes they are adaptable to put different logos on there to show partnerships. And these are our promotional, well, our playbills that have the resources on the back along with a synopsis on the inside of the different, uh, different monologues and plays that we have. Next slide. So, this is just a little bit of the data that we have uh, collected. I thought this would be uh, worthy of mentioning. We have uh, for the colorectal cancer monologue and play, uh, you see that there was an increase of individuals likely to go and seek uh, colorectal cancer screening tests after seeing the uh, play or the monologue. And it's the same thing for the Hispanic community. Uh, we found that this has been a very, uh, very useful resource for uh, people who may have had barriers and uh, or were hesitant about getting screened that they will after being after hearing these motivational methods and uh, getting uh, dispelling myths and things like that. Next slide. So as with everyone, we've had to take a shift in doing our education outreach, uh, the pandemic came out and impacted everyone. So we screenings as a result of that, screenings have been delayed. Groups aren't able to get together like we've done in the past. And we had to come up with an innovative strategy to, um, in the meanwhile, to adapt to the new normal. Next slide. So for our online resources, we do have, um, these are a list of the monologues that we have available. Uh, they are uh, on our YouTube channel. And what we've been doing is we've been very realistic about how many attendees we can get. We try to do a lot of pre-planning to go along with that, collaborating and doing cross-promotion through various forms of social media, using platforms like Zoom where participants have to register so that we get a count of whom is, who are attending the performances. We practice with our collaborators to make sure that things go by seamlessly. And we give a max of an hour for the whole webinar along with links for the survey, Q&A, and, um, and closure and so that it can be a true interactive experience. Next slide. And so um, with this being said, I couldn't do this without the, the leadership that I have along with the staff that works along with this. We're a small group, but we do a whole lot and um, just want to mention them as well. And the next slide. And if there's any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Our, um, the websites are up there, our, our social media handles and my email as well. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to our four uh, incredible speakers. Um, I just want to make a program note that uh, the um, adjourning session uh, for the meeting will start at uh, 4.35. So we only we have a very brief time for uh, uh, questions. Um, so uh, can I ask one question that I'd like for each of the panelists to answer briefly? Um, and uh, this is a question from the, the audience. Uh, what do you think would be the one highest impact tool to reach underserved communities? Uh, and we can start. Yes, uh, uh, go ahead, Charles. Yeah, so I would say the key tool is you have to meet them where they are. So for instance, when I was trying to recruit um, men for these focus groups, um, you know, I had this fancy website and um, um, I made, you know, I let them sign up the time that was best for them. And I had it on Saturdays and, you know, all these different things to make it their way. And they did not show up. So what I had to do was get feedback from the community in terms of their thoughts of, of how I should, you know, really get them to be engaged. And they said, go to where they are. So me and my team literally went to traditional churches. Um, and we sat through the service, the, you know, the pastors would, would, would uh, introduce us, and then we met with the participants right after church. 
And so we had to cut our time down substantially, for, you know, to make it all happen, to be considerate of people on Sunday, they have Sunday dinner with their families. This is all pre-COVID. Um, so we may not remember how things used to be. Um, but but that was very critical. For instance, when I did this in, um, in uh, Minnesota at a traditional Baptist church on a first Sunday, which is communion Sunday, which is literally typically two hours, I still had 22 men that were eager to stay afterwards to do a focus group because they never had the opportunity as men to get together and just talk about that over food provided by the church ministry, et cetera. So in brief, again, the biggest thing is you have to meet people where they are. Thank you, Charles. Uh, Janice and uh, Eric, did you want to uh, answer that? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And um, to just follow up in, in the current environment where that is right now is home. And so as we think about, we got to, we, you know, one advantage of technology is that, you know, more and more people are, are using that to connect with others. Um, and I think if we use it strategically, we're able to uh, provide some information at times and locations when people have the time, um, rather than consistently requiring them to go to the clinic to get, a, you know, a a screening that we know that they need. <laughs> we can do that at home, so. Thank you, Janice. Um, Roshando, would you like to, to answer that question? I would agree um, with uh, Dr. Rogers and what he was saying about meeting people where they are. Um, one of the key things that I've noticed just on, from the clinical perspective and from the community perspective, having key stakeholders is very important because there is still very much this distrust uh, among uh, minority populations, minority communities and, and getting there. And not to mention, we have to think outside the box. We um, going into a brick and mortar place. And just like I, um, we work in, well, I work in the largest medical center in the, in the world. And people don't wanna go there because it's confusing. They don't wanna go there because it's the pay for parking and things like that. So having, uh, being in the community, being a part of the community, and even for the fact of having these flexible hours going into the community-based community, uh, community -based organizations like the barbershops, the churches, the beauty shops, and being able to provide that resource and let those individuals know that we're there for them, that is helpful. And also having more people of color at the table when we're having these type of uh, interventions that are being developed, because it does matter. It matters, um, you know, because you can have something that's available that may, we all have our research backgrounds and things of that nature, but if it's something that does not include the culture, it's not gonna work. Thank you, Rashonda. And Tracy, uh, you are gonna have the last comment. Um, yeah, I would agree with all of our speakers um, saying meeting clients where they are, but also, um, Having uh, this be a priority for clinicians and for staff, um, I think it's easy with COVID for other things to take priority. And um, as some of the speakers yesterday mentioned, we have a lot of, we've fallen behind on this cancer screening work and that's going to impact care for the decade to come. And so um, really making this something that we don't drop um, as part of our care, that this is really, um, pivotal and still a priority in spite of COVID um, and ensuring that we make this, um, these cancer screenings as accessible uh, for our telehealth clients um, and having it as front and center as possible, giving providers the tools uh, needed to um, not forget about this work um, and to be able to address it at their visits. Um, so keeping, keeping cancer screenings at the front and center. Thank you, uh, Jan. Uh, thank you, uh, Tracy. Um, and uh, so thank you to all, all of our uh, incredible panelists, uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Krieger, Dr. Cooks, uh, Dr. Rogers, uh, Tracy, uh, and Dr. Chenier. Thank you so much for your insights. Thank you to the audience for being a, a part of this uh, and, and uh, a wonderful way to close out. Um, and to piggyback on the last session. If we can all head over to the um, adjourning session, uh, that would be great. Thank you again. <laughs>